Hello, this is a lecture on Christian Worldview, uh, CWV 101 for Grand Canyon University. And this is a final exam overview that will be taking a lot of information from the textbooks. So it really could be helpful for any, any class on Christian Worldview, hopefully. So we'll start with um, topic one. And again, this is a final review uh, CWV final re final exam overview. My name is Thomas Linton. So we start with define uh, defining our term. So what is a worldview? So there's a, four different definitions here. Uh, two of them are very basic, and the last two are a little bit more in depth. So you get the first one: a set of assumptions or beliefs about reality that affect how we think and how we live. Uh, the next one, the comprehensive perspective from which we interpret all of reality. Uh, Sire gives it a little bit more in depth. He says a commitment, a fundamental orientation of the heart that can be expressed as a story or in a set of presuppositions, um, so assumptions we may uh, that may be true, partially true, or entirely false, which we hold cons uh, consciously or subconsciously, consistently or inconsistently about the basic constitution of reality, and that provides the foundation on which we live and move and have our being. So that's a little bit more in depth by James Sarr. Now, Gary DeMar provides a little bit different uh, helpful definition. He says there are only two worldviews, the Christian, and he puts in parentheses, biblical worldview, and the humanistic or man-centered worldview. There are, however, worldviews within worldviews, because no one is totally consistent. Even so, these worldviews within worldviews still rest upon the basic presuppositions of a biblical or humanistic worldview. So, let's move on to uh, this is straight out. Of, this is straight out of the textbook. What makes up a worldview? A set of assumptions. An assumption is an underlying belief that is presupposed or presumed. Um, in advance of careful reason and reflection. A worldview is composed of assumptions to which a person commits, a framework of, for understanding. A worldview from the conceptual uh, for, worldviews form a conceptual framework that enables a person to make sense of information that is gathered through observation experience and impact on behavior, a set of assumptions that provides a foundational framework for thought also guides speech and action. So as you see here, worldview in a sense guides the whole way we live our life, how we conduct ourselves, and how we um, even how we conduct speech and how we talk to others, how we behave. Uh, worldviews are important in that respect. So the question now is, how does a worldview work? So there's, the textbook provides four different illustrations of how a worldview works. The first is a lens, and you see the lady with sunglasses on. So the lens by which we look and observe and experience the world. Uh, the second is a uh, top of a jigsaw uh, puzzle box, a box of, you know, the top of it, the box top of a jigsaw puzzle that kind of shows the the end result, uh, how when all the pieces are together, how does the, how does it look? Uh, how does the picture look? And that's essentially how a worldview looks. The other is a foundation of a building. So you see the foundation, but everything else is built uh, built upon. And then the last one's a story. So how the story is put together. So. So we see here worldview analysis. Um, a worldview is a foundational set of assumptions to which one commits, which serve as a framework for understanding and interpreting reality um, and deeply shapes one's behavior. People behave as they do because they believe certain truth claims. Everyone has a worldview. Each person builds his or her beliefs on, founda on the foundation of worldview. Each person interprets reality through the lens of worldview. And each person attempts to fit beliefs together according to the puzzle box picture of worldview. Worldview tells a story of reality through which one explains the world. 
worldviews can be described as both private and shared. A private worldview describes one's personal convictions about reality, and, share, and a shared worldview describes the shared convictions of a community. Worldview is supported by both faith and reason. Every worldview requires both faith and reason. So, a worldview of uh, evaluation. The worldview involves the idea of what is reality, ultimate reality. So, is there a God? Is there not a God? And is this God personal or impersonal? Of the universe is it opened or closed system. An open universe allows for miracles. A closed universe does not. What is human nature? What does it mean to be a human? Uh, theory of knowledge is truth knowable. Ethics: What is right and wrong? And purpose: Why are we here? And what what happens when we die? The worldview families, and this is another important uh, concept that will uh, that direct, comes directly from the textbook. And this is theism, which means there's a belief in a monotheistic one God, and this is shared by um, Christians, Muslims, and Jew, Judaism. And uh, so Christian, Islam, and Judaism. Then there's pantheism. Pantheism, so the, whereas theism is belief in a God, one God, um, pantheism is a belief in many gods. Pan meaning many, or I mean not many, polytheism would be many gods. Pantheism would be everything is God. So there's just one God, but everything the universe and ourselves are all part of that God. And then atheism, no God at all. There's no God. And part of the atheistic worldview, a sub, a sub, a sub worldview within that is uh, agnosticism, that we don't know there's a God. Now, remember Gary DeMar's definition about there being two worldviews. Now, I mentioned that because here I have a quote from Jesus, the words of Jesus, okay? And Jesus says here that everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the wind blew and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it was founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rains fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. So you see here, it kind of illustrates two worldviews. You're either building your life on Christ, the rock, or you're building your life on the ruinous sands of um, humanism and its different forms. So that's kind of where it can, comes from, Gary DeMar's definition. So we see here worldview tests. Um, there's a coherence test, there's a correspondence test, and then there's the practical test. So you know, this is how you find out, is your, is your worldview, um, does it pass the test? Is it, is it, is it coherent? Is a worldview te uh, test that examines the internal consistency and rational coherence of uh, worldview assumptions? Then there's a correspondence test that examines a worldview ability to provide a co uh, cognitive explanation of reality. And then and then there's the practical test that examines a worldview's workability and practical value in, mo in the most important areas of life and experience. So these are all, this is from the textbook. Uh, so there's a um, good chance that this will um, be on the final exam. So then we get to uh, worldviews and cognitive dis dissonance. This describes the tension and discomfort that arises uh, when a person tries to hold two or more con contradictory beliefs or ideas at the same time. So if you have multiple beliefs that are collide with each other, insistent and not do not um, are inconsistent with each other and contradictory to each other, then eventually you know those collide. Those beliefs come into conflict with each other. And then the second point is, even though the person may not believe that his or her convictions are correct, he or she may choose to suppress attention, ignore 
his or her conscience and act in ways he or she uh, can live with rather than ways that truly align with his or her worldview. So it's living in inconsistency. Can you live your worldview out? Can you uh, live your worldview out consistently? And that's, if you can't, then that's an, a problem. And that's a sign that your worldview might be need to be changed. So now that we kind of examined worldview, that's topic one. Topic two dealt with deals with origins, a God-centered God and God-centered universe. This is the first story of uh, the biblical story, the biblical narrative, the biblical the historical, the redemptive historical narrative of the Bible. Uh, first, we want to talk about the nature of God, the nature of God as one God in three persons. So, let's see if I can do that. There you go. This looks better. So, Trinitarian God of Christianity, the doctrine of God in three persons existing e eternally in, in, in internal self consciousness prior to his relationship to the world. The Trinity consists of one divine being in, th in three persons the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this quote from Van Tell says, Christianity offers a triune God, the absolute personality, containing all the attributes enamored, enamorated as God in whom we believe. This conception of God is the foundation of everything else that we hold dear. Unless we can believe in this sort of God, it does us no good to hold that we may believe in some sort of God. Or in anything else, for everything depends on its meaning, for its meaning upon this sort of God. Accordingly, we are not interested to have anyone to prove, uh, to have anyone to prove the existence of any other sort of God but this God. So, the existence of God, we're trying to prove, we're not trying to prove any other God but the Trinity God of the Bible. So we move on. Let's see. We move on to the characteristics of God. So God is omniscient, meaning all knowing. God is omnipotent, all powerful, and holy good and sovereign. So God's a sovereign God that controls all things that come to pass. That nothing happens on accident in God's world. So the doctrine of divine simplicity teaches that one, God is identical with his existence and his essence. And two, that each of his attributes is ontologically identical with his existence and with each other, um, each other, every other one of his attributes. There is nothing in God that is not God. So that's the kind of the God is all in the, all, all that is in God, that there are no parts to God. God is who he is. So the nature of scripture. But on sound theological grounds, we can make these two claims, okay? One, the inspiration of copyists and the perfect tr transmission of scriptures has not been promised by God. So God did not promise the, the copyists and the people um, copying this transmission, transmitting this, the original text are inerrant. Two, the extraordinary quality of God's revealed word must be guarded against arbitrary alteration. So that's kind of one leads to two in that perspective. So then we can move on to to the, the final point here regarding the nature of Scripture, that the evangelical restriction of inerrancy to the original autograph is warranted, important, and defensible. Further, it does not jeopardize the adequacy and authority of, the, of our present Bible. We can trust our present Bible, whether it be ESV, uh, KGV, um, NIV, whatever it may be, we can trust it because, uh, you know, God's preserved his truth and his word. So God's att attributes attributes in creation. Romans one twenty says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made, 
so that people are without excuse. So there's no one is uh, has excuse for denying God. So Genesis 126, then we're going to move on. It says, God, then God said, let us make man in our image and our likeness, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all of the earth and over creeping things that creeps on the earth. So we see here that there's a two, two very important things that we get from this scripture passage. First is humanity created in the image of God. And second is the dominion mandate, that we were give, given dominion over all the rest of the earth to take care of it and to be God's representative on the rest of the earth. So this statement says, God's words here attest to a plurality in God, a plurality later expressed in the doctrine of the Trinity. The original readers would not have grasped this, but we, with the full plot disclosed, can, re can revisit this passage and see the clues the clues there. So this is the idea of the Trinity from the beginning. The doctrine of the Trinity was there. It's just it's been progressively revealed. Um, now it doesn't mean that they, you know, they. That doesn't mean that the Trinity wasn't there and he didn't reveal himself. It just means that you know the doctrine of the Trinity has progressed over time. So there is an ultimate unity and diversity uh, within the tr within the Trinity. So there's uh, unity, meaning that the three persons of the Trinity are, are ultimately united in, in, in being God, but they're ultimately diverse too. So they're all they're three different persons. And that's kind of a complex t saying. It plays into the idea of the one and the many, um, the problem of, of the one and the many. The Genesis account of creation. So we get to the first plot of, of uh, the Bible, the creation narrative, that creation is the first act of the biblical storyline, a proper understanding of creation that lays the frame, the groundwork for understanding the rest of the storyline of the Bible. The biblical account of creation presents God as the creator of all things, explains the nature of his creation, and gives particular focus on humanity as being created in his image. So Humanities in his image. Uh, there's an emphasis here on the creator creature distinctive, that there's a distinction between create, creator and creation. And that this is important because this is where our metaphysic, this is where ultimate reality comes into play. We believe in a distinction be between the creator and the created. Three common views on creation Young Earth creation, creation is a literal 24 hour, six days. This view takes a literal interpretation of Genesis 1 and typically believes that the earth is about 10,000 years old. Old earth creation holds to an old earth and non-literal interpretation of Genesis 1. Examples are framework hypothesis and gap theory. And then there's theistic evolution holds to a view that sees God as directing and guiding the process of evolution. So we're moving on to Topic three now, the nature and purpose uh, of hu human nature and purpose. So you see the puzzle there that kind of indicates that they're fitting together. Nature and purpose kind of go together, and human nature and human purpose. So what is the chief end of man? This is the confession, uh, both Westminster and London Baptist Confession of Faith 1689 state that man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Man's fallen as fallen image bearers. So Genesis 2, 16 to 17, God gives the command to Adam uh, to not eat of the fruit from the knowledge of, uh, of good and evil, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Genesis 3 then covers the fall of humanity and the consequences and the curse. This was essentially a call to follow God as the ultimate standard for knowledge and morality, or to take things into our own hands. The rebellion from God then impacted all of humanity that is now born into sin. So we all bear the sin nature. The fall was the ultimate act of rebellion that changed the very nature of humanity. Adam and Eve sought to change their position as the royal stewards over the created order and overreached. Dissatisfied with their humanness, 
the couple reached for godhood and lusting after a throne that was not theirs they lost the privileges they already had they uh they degraded themselves by trying to become what they could never be never be god or created to be image of god the result of the fall sin and death though the fall of humanity into sin death entered the world so through the fall sorry through the fall of humanity sin entered the world death entered the world the effects of sin and death are immediately uh, apparent in genesis 4 with the murder of abel at the hands of his brother cain in genesis 2 17 god said that death would enter the world if they ate of the uh, fruit of the tree of knowledge and good and, of good and evil and now not only did sin and death affect Adam and Eve, but also their children. Narratively speaking, sin and death are immediately present when Cain kills Abel. Although the form of Cain's worship seems to have been correct, the narrative suggests that Cain himself was the problem. The mundane description of his offering suggests that he was merely, perhaps dutifully, going through the motions. So he was just kind of doing his thing. And sometimes that can be a uh, something of conviction for us. Are we going through the motions Sunday morning when we're uh, presenting our tithe and offering to God and we're going to worship God? Are we worshiping him with a genuine heart? Or are we uh, going through the motions just doing it for the sake of doing it? The major themes of Genesis after creation. The second act of the biblical storyline is the temptation and fall of, huma of humanity into sin through the sin of adam and eve humans are sinful by nature and are separated from god because of their sin because of adam and eve's sin the history of humanity is characterized by a departure from wisdom but god brings hope deliverance and redemption god was faithful to his covenant promises and despite the people's faith uh, unfaithfulness he did what he said he was going to do while god is patient and forgiving he is also a just judge that does not let sin go unpunished. So we're moving on to topic three. Topic three is on who is Jesus Christ. And this is an important one. This is uh, essential to um, the Christian worldview. The Christian worldview says that Jesus is 100% or fully man and 100% or fully God. He's both 100%. God, 100% man, or as you want to put it, fully man and fully God. This is also known as the hypostatic union. So some some essential beliefs about Jesus, okay? Uh, virgin birth, it's important to understand that there's a the virgin birth. Uh, Jesus lived a sinless life. Uh, Jesus performed miracles. Jesus' death was by crucifixion. He was buried for three days. Jesus resurrected on the third day, and then Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father. And then finally, Jesus is going to return, a victor have a victorious return. So I want to present the Messianic Psalms. So first, Psalm 2, I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. So the question I ask is, so is is uh, he going to take up the offer of having the nations his his possession, earth his possession, the nations his heritage? So I think that, that the idea is that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, is going to take the nations as his heritage, is going to have the earth as his possession. So Psalm 22 says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And this is what Jesus quotes, um, well, dying on the cross while being crucified. And then finally, the third one I want to present is Psalm 110 and verse 1. The Lord is your footstool. Now, Psalm 110, 1 is really important. Okay, it's an important psalm because it's how more often it's mentioned Then it's also mentioned in Acts. Paul mentions it, and it's mentioned in Hebrews. So I, I present 
that was presented in. The first is in Acts 2, 34 to 35. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Then we go to 1 Corinthians 15. So 1 Corinthians 15, the first part of it is discussing uh, the testimony of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay? Then it gets to his ascension, and now he's going to return. Okay? This is the context of the scripture passage. So I'm going to read it. Just understand this context of it. Okay? But each in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. So this is talking about the second coming of Jesus. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to the God the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put under are put in subjection, it is plain that he is expected to put all things in subjection under him. So all his enemies are going to be a footstool. So we move on to topic uh, four now, which is God's plan for salvation, re redemption, um, rescue, renewal. We are sinners. We have all fallen. We are all born in sin now, and we're fallen humanity. Uh, this is seen in the world. We have a lot of bad things going on in the world. We have broken relationships ourselves. Um, then we're rescued. The proto, the pro evangelion, which is the first gospel or first evangelism. Uh, then you have redemption by grace through faith. And then renewal, all things are made new again. So sin nature, Romans 3.23, reads, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Then you have Isaiah 53.6, All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid, a, laid on him the iniquity of us all. So we are all gone astray from God, and we've gone our own way. We've gone out. We've did, we've followed Adam and going our own way, and wanting to be gods ourselves, and wanting to determine right and wrong, and wanting to be the arbiters of truth and morality. But Jesus took on the sins of us, our sins, and the iniquity. Our iniquities have been laid on Him. The corruption of the human heart. In answer to this question, Paul reserved the reason why the law was given. The law was not given to make people good, but rather to show people how evil they are. And that's Romans 3.20. He said the law only intensified, intensified human sin, Romans 5.20. And what this means essentially is that, you know, in the Old Testament, Israel, you know, they got, there's times where they're, their nation was the law alone, the law apart from the grace of God, it just exposes our sin. Now, you know, I'll, I'll quote Greg Bonson here. He said, grace without law is disgrace because, you know, there is, God, God does have moral standards for us and what he expects us to live, how he expects us to conduct ourselves. Now, we can't do it on our own. We can't please God apart from Jesus. So the Proto-Evangelion. I will put, this is from Genesis 3.15. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And that's foreshadowing Jesus. So let's continue on justification by faith. In the New Testament, the event around which the human heart is restored is called justification by faith. It receives its most sustained treatment in the book of Romans, Paul's letter to the Church of Rome. Romans reveals that 
The issue of justification goes all the way back to the covenant with Abraham. Recall, this covenant was the beginning of God's plan to save humanity. Through Abraham's family, um, all the families of the earth would be blessed. But the blessing of humanity in Abraham consisted of the development of a nation, the people of Israel, who were to obey God's law and thereby exemplify to the world the justice of God and God's true intentions for humanity. And then I quote Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Christian ethics. There's a lot to be said about Christian ethics, but I'm just going to present this little um, tidbit here. This little statement. For Jesus, love, of, love for God does not come at the expense of love for one's own fellow human being. This brings us deep into the logic of the Christian worldview. The reason for this, quite simply, is that humans reflect the image of God. If an individual cannot bring oneself to love a fellow human being created in the image of God, uh, he or she will not be able to love God. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has uh, seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And that's from 1 John 4.20. And one thing to think about here in our current cultural context is the issue of abortion in our nation. So if, as a Christian say, that the unborn are in fact image bearers of God, then we're supposed to, we're called to love thy neighbor and love them. Um, so that's something to keep in perspective here when thinking about this and the Christian ethic. And, you know, I know that there might be someone who listens to this who has had an abortion. And I just want to encourage you, you have forgiveness in Jesus Christ. That guilt is, does not remain on you. And um, he will forgive. He's faithful in forgiving. So we said one way to salvation uh, and the idea of Jesus being faithful to forgive. So it says, when, it, when, this, uh, when this has spoken of salvation, the emphasis has not been on uh, a destination, but uh on destination but location in other words it is not about how one gets to heaven but how one can receive forgiveness fellowship and restoration with the holy train god been estranged since the fall of adam certainly this volume affirms humanity as has been estranged since the fall of adam certainly this volume affirms the destination of heaven and hell uh heaven and eternal life however it also holds um, that begins here on earth as individuals give their lives to Christ and are forgiven of their sins. Some have made the case that about Christianity not just proclaims Jesus as the only way to salvation, but it is the only uh, faith that is offering salvation. Hinduism offers liberation from the death, from death and life cycle. Islam, the hope of obtaining the mercy of Allah through submission to his will, whereas Buddhism's goal is emptiness of self. Christianity among the major religions is unique in suggesting that one can be brought back into right relationship with the God of the universe, with the triune God of the Bible. Religious pluralism. Religious pluralism is the concept that there are many ways to God, that one's own religion probably is not the whole story, and that other religions add to the full understanding. Religious pluralism will be will hold that different religions, when considered carefully, are not really all that different. It is based on the belief that two or more opposing beliefs can be compatible at the same time, in the same way. According to this view, ultimately, all religions say the same things 
or at least offer a uh, offer a piece of reality. Christian exclusivism is the concept that there is only one way to God or to pleasing God. This is sometimes referred to as restrictivist or essentialist view. It, it is noted in it is noted that the religious exclusivist phrase can be coined in derision to the belief that there is only one way to salvation. So we get to um, the worldview implications of living. How do we live with a purpose? This is the final section. So absolute versus relative truth. The truth can apply to all people in all contexts. Relative truth is relative to the individual or culture. Revelation of God, here it says, the Christian worldview believes that God reveals himself in two ways, through general revelation and through special revelation. General revelation refers to the ways that God reveals himself as created throughout the course of history and in the natural laws that commonly are discerned through scientific analysis. Special revelation refers to the ways that God reveals himself to individuals and communities who can then share what he has made known with others. The prime example of special revelation is the Bible, which is made up of 66 books that reveals God's nature and will. Another example, which is reported in the Bible, is the person of Jesus Christ. So presuppositionalism uses an indirect proof for the existence of so our view, the Christian worldview, and then we try to show the opponent's worldview as absurdity, and therefore our view is correct. How indirect proofs work? Indirect proofs do not require the apologist to assume any type of neutrality with the unbeliever, as in effect an internal critique of the unbeliever's worldview and exposes the absurdity of the unbelieving worldview. Traditional arguments do not argue for the triune God, instead argue for a minimalistic theism. So the common assumptions that everybody makes as universals and particulars, uh, existence of other personal minds, uniformity of nature, mathematical principles, the laws of logic, love, beauty, and justice. And there's others, but those are the ones I'm mentioning right now. Those are considered the transcendentals. Now, other worldviews assume this, but only Christianity can account for all these. So I want to start, I want to apply this to the problem of evil. Okay, do an internal critique. So J.L. Mackey was an early 1900s philosopher, and he provided the logical problem of evil. And in this, he said that it is impossible, it's a contradiction, logically impossible, for God and evil to exist. And I'm going to briefly show what the logical problem of evil says. So it says, God is omnipotent, all-powerful. God is omniscient, all-knowing. God is perfectly good and evil exists. So he goes through this and he provides what he considers an argument for um, that, God, that they're the logical problem of evil, that God logically cannot exist and evil exists. So I'm not going to go through all the, I'm just going to show the slides and I'm moving forward, okay? And eventually, I just want to make sure that everybody has a time to kind of read it and get an idea of what it's talking about. So the logical problem of evil concludes that God, being omniscient, omnipotent, and wholly good, there's no way that he can also uh, allow evil. So if God is omniscient, then evil should not exist in the world. But evil does exist in the world, therefore God does not exist is the argument. Now, Alvin Planica provided what's called the free will defense. And I'm just going to essentially what he says is uh, freedom. Um, so, you know, creatures, humans who are significantly free cannot be causally determined to do what is right, to do only what is right. Thus, if God creates creatures who are significantly free, he cannot causally determine them to do only what is right. Thus, if God creates creatures who are significantly free, he must create creatures who are capable of moral evil. Thus, if God creates a world containing creatures who are significantly free, it will contain creatures who are capable of moral evil. If God creates a world containing creatures who are capable of moral evil, he cannot guarantee 
that there will not be evil in the world. Thus, if God creates a world containing creatures who are significantly free, he cannot guarantee that there will not be evil in the world. A world containing creatures who are significantly free and f- free to perform morally good and evil actions is morally is more valuable, all else being equal, than a world containing no free creatures at all. Thus, God has good reason to create a world containing creatures who are significantly free. And thus the conclusion is God has good reasons to create a world which he cannot guarantee will not contain some evil. Now we move on to William Rowe's evidential argument uh, for the problem of evil. So he provides evidences for saying that it's more likely that God doesn't exist than he does exist. The argument essentially is there are intense instances of intense suffering or seemingly gratuitous evil, meaning evil that does not have any purpose, which is an omniscient, omnipotent, omniscient, unholy good being would have prevented without thereby losing some greater good or permitting some evil equally bad or worse. An omnipotent, omniscient, holy good being would prevent the occurrence of any intense suffering it could, unless it could not do so without thereby losing some greater good or permitting some evil equally bad or worse. There does ex- does not exist an omniscient, um, uh, omnipotent, omniscient, holy good being. The argument is valid, therefore, if we have re- we have rational grounds for accepting its premises to the extent that we have rational grounds for accepting atheism. So there are various theodicies. There's a free will theodicy that appeals to free will of human race, uh, human choice. God created humanity with a certain amount of free will, and much of that evil in the world is a result of human choice and misuse of human freedom. Then there's a natural law theodicy. It talks about the law of nature, natural laws. Soul building theodicy, which talks about how it's to build our character and soul. And then there's the population struggle theodicy. Those are theodicies. Theodicy is a justification for um, why God allows evil. Now, I want to focus on a presuppositional response to the problem of evil. Uh, the presuppositionalist acknowledges that, can, you know, first of all, it can respond to both logical and evidential problems of evil. Uh, but we ultimately do start off by acknowledging that there is a real problem of evil in the world. Evil is real. Suffering is real. We all have have experienced it probably to some extent or another. Uh, some people are born with diseases. I myself am born with, I, had, I was born with a condition called Marfan syndrome. That's, I had open heart surgery when I was 30 years old. The presuppositionalist uh, then acknowledges first and foremost that there is evil in the world. Uh, man, through One, through man's inhuman, uh, inhumanity in every age of hi- human history, and in every nation of the world, there has been oppression, indignity, unkindness, torture, greed, murder, and tyranny. Natural evil. In the natural world, we come across earthquakes, typhoons, hurricanes, birth defects, crippling injuries, and other things, etc. So, what does the believer mean by good? Or by what standard is the unbeliever to determine what counts as good? So that evil uh, is... According, is accordingly defined or identified. What are the presuppositions in which the unbeliever makes the moral judgments whatsoever? So there's a couple of different options the unbeliever has. So the popular opinion or cultural relativism. Sometimes it is right and wrong because the majority of people agree. Um, we look at Hitler in the Nazi Germany. Well, the majority of people believed that it's okay to have concentration camps. Um, but it was wrong, according to the Christian worldview. Uh, then there's utilitarian view of ethics. Something is right or wrong based upon what brings about the greatest amount of happiness to the greatest number of people. But then again, who determines what that is? Who determines what is the greatest? Bonson's response then, Greg Bonson, philosopher, Christian philosopher Greg Bonson says, Philosophically speaking, the problem of evil turns out to be, therefore, a problem for the unbeliever himself. In order to use the argument from evil against the Christian worldview, he must first be able to show that his judgments about the existence of evil are meaningful, which is precisely what the unbelieving worldview is unable to do. They're unable to provide a meaningful judgment for what is evil in the world, for what obje- there's no objective standard to con- 
to constitute what evil is. So we go to Christian response then in the Christian worldview of the problem of evil. We go back to the garden, the first moral, cho moral choice. The problem of evil comes down to the question of whether a person should have faith in God and his word or place faith in um, the person's own human thinking and values. Adam and Eve were confronted with the very, this very choice. God commanded them not to eat of a certain tree, thus testing them. The choice was to define good and evil according to God's standard or define good and evil according to their own autonomous standard. And autonomous is self-law or self, yeah, self-law. So the moral choice, first moral choice. Um, this is from Bosserman's book, The Trinity and the Vindication of Christian Paradox. It says, Adam's distrust of God's word and eating from the uh, tree of good and evil uh, disrupted fatally the objective and subjective harmony of the created universe. As a covenantal representative of the collective human ego, Adam's faithless disposition towards God passed to every subsequent person in such a way that fallen men uh, suppose their fallenness to be perfectly normal. By the same right, the objects of fallen science are not only in, incomplete, excluding God, but broken and disorderly because of the undermitting wrath of God. Whereas the original human subject could trust himself, the myriad of baseless opi uh, opinions entertained by fallen humanity, not to mention the ethical strife between individuals and society, has led many to skepticism that consensus uh, consensus must less objective truth is attainable. So we conclude then, what we find then is that the unbeliever must secretly rely upon the Christian worldview in order to make sense of his own arguments against the existence of evil to which they argue against the Christian worldview. In any case, anti-theism pre presupposes theism to make its case. They must secretly rely on the Christian worldview and its ethics to make an argument against the Christian worldview is God. So here's a picture. This is a Nobel Prize winner who took a picture of this this starving baby who is about to be eaten by a vulture. And it's to be noted that you know this pho photographer took his life shortly after winning the prize. Um, just goes to show you that you know there is value in human dignity in life, and some and there's also horrible evil in this world that we. You know, we can account for as Christians, and we understand why it happened. It happened because of the fall. The Holocaust, again, I mentioned that before. The cultural relatives can't say that the Holocaust is wrong. Then there's 9-11 terrorist attacks. Is it evil? Why? In your own worldview, how do you account for this? So I want to read from Van Til's uh, task of, in relation to... Uh, To evil. The Van Til said, our task with respect to the destruction of evil is uh, not ended when we, when we have sought to fight sin everywhere we see it. We have further obligation to destroy the consequences of sin in this world as far as we can. We must do good to all men, especially those of the household of faith, to help relieve uh, something of the suffering of the creatures of God is our privilege and our task. I want to leave you here with the Great Commission. Great Commission is Jesus, uh, after he resurrected, before he ascended, he says this, and Jesus came to heaven and on earth, has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to deserve all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And so if you're a Christian and you to uh, uh, in your Christian walk, and I just encourage you to go make disciples. If you're not a Christian, you've listened to this video, hopefully it's challenged you in your own walk and who you believe Jesus is and what your worldview is. So I'm going to close this in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just pray for um, this lecture to have helped people, Lord. And Lord, we just pray for... Um, that this will help people with their tests, but also help people with their spiritual walk, Lord. Um, I pray it can be used to glorify your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.